Welcome to the show, everybody. As you may know, we're taking a break from interviews for a time as we reformat the show. And I think we're very close to the new format. I'm getting pretty excited about it. I think you're going to enjoy it an awful lot. In the meantime, I'm reading essays that we've published on our magazine side over the course of the last year or so. And today I'm reading the second installment in a four-part series called The Divorce Lawyer's Guide to Marriage. So this is part two, and here we go. Being a divorce lawyer was not always easy on my relationships or me. In fact, it tested me more than I ever expected. Out of the process, I found myself left with some unexpected insights about relationship health. Last week, I wrote about the lessons I learned on the topic of commitment. And this week, I'm turning to some universal truths about love that I picked up in divorce court. One, your complaints are probably symptoms of a deeper issue. Two common patterns become very clear in a divorce. First, we humans repeat our complaints over and over regardless of our actual circumstances. It's as if the complaints themselves give us comfort and meaning, and the actual facts are secondary to those. I see this frequently play itself out in political conversations, and we see it in our personal relationships. For example, I'm the one who does all the work around here, or you just don't respect me. The complaints tend to remain the same over a lifetime. Only the circumstances actually change, and that's backwards. Second, from one person to the next, we see that people have completely different reactions to the exact same circumstances. One man's garbage is another man's treasure, as the saying goes. To one person, infidelity is a disaster. To another, it's a hiccup, for example. When these two patterns meet, What becomes clear is that our complaints are not rooted in our circumstances, but in something much deeper and much older. The psychological community often talks about this in terms of old wounds from childhood. We all have unresolved fears and traumas from childhood, and the behavior patterns those traumas create play out in our daily lives as adults. Therapy helps us recognize and deconstruct those patterns so we gain a measure of freedom from them. You might also take a spiritual perspective and think of these patterns as karma or something similar. These patterns, however you think of them, manifest in our intimate relationships perhaps more than anywhere else in life. For many of us, the pain that comes with having our patterns triggered is too great to bear, and so we blame our partner. But the pain is ours alone. We are responsible for our own experience and our own patterns. Experiences and feelings do not just float about in the universe and land on us. They are generated within, by us, and for us. Now, I say for us because I've found that there is value in recognizing the patterns. There are lessons available in the pain if we're willing to listen. If we want our relationships to survive, it is our duty to manage our triggers. Step one is to recognize and acknowledge that our complaints run deeper than our circumstances. Step two is to bring them into the light of awareness and understand how these triggers operate. Step three is to realize that you are not your triggers. You are something much, much greater. If you do not deal with your issues, triggers, patterns, they will follow you from one relationship to the next until you do face them. So my friends, get started. You owe it to your partner, if not to yourself. Two. Being right is usually not worth the cost. Most of the time, it simply doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. Perhaps if you're on a battlefield, then life and death decisions rely on your judgment. But when you're having a disagreement with your partner, it probably just doesn't matter. If you look deep, you'll see that your need to be right is rooted in fear. Some belief, way down deep, is telling you that if you don't convince your partner of this particular issue, then things are going to be very, very bad. What you're not seeing is that insisting on being right is slowly killing your relationship also. Maybe it's true that bad things will happen if you don't convince your partner this time. There are certainly important decisions that need to be made in relationships. But if you're being honest, most of the time, that's just not the case. Now, why should you care? Because insisting on being right will destroy any hope of a real connection in your relationship. An intimate emotional connection relies on our understanding and sharing of our core experience with one another, of seeing one another. 
The knee-jerk need to be right is really just a way of putting up walls around your fear, and that is the opposite of connecting. Also, nobody is right all the time. Insisting that you are is crying wolf. It destroys your credibility for the times when it really does matter. And the lack of credibility in a relationship means that your partner is just tolerating you rather than respecting and connecting with you. The challenge is that we only have the experience that starts behind our own eyeballs. Everything in the world appears to revolve around us, and so it seems that it must be the case. How could it be otherwise? This raises the distinction between experience and truth. Your experience is totally legitimate as an experience, but it may not be objectively accurate. And it doesn't really matter either way if what you want is a warm, connected relationship. The antidote to the cycle is recognizing and understanding the fear at the core of your argument. Ask yourself whether the issue you're debating truly matters to your safety or your well-being. If it does, then manage the issue appropriately. Since it probably doesn't, I advise that you let it drop this time. Don't be right. And start now, because look, this takes practice. 3. You can probably win any argument just by being the craziest or the most stubborn, but it will ruin your relationships and numb you to life. One of the dirty secrets about our legal system is rooted in a basic human truth. The crazier and the more stubborn person almost always wins the fight. And this is because it's not usually worth the resources required to win a long fight, even if you're the person in the right. Attorney's fees and emotional anguish almost always outweigh any return you're likely to get by winning a court case. The crazy and the stubborn among us don't care about the cost, and so they often win by attrition. The costs, however, always get paid, whether in wasted time, emotional pain, money, or lost human connection. It's not that the crazy person in this situation doesn't pay the price, it's that they don't care what they have to pay. In the relationship context, the cost is the relationship itself. Much like insisting on being right, the dogged insistence on winning at all costs will result in a dead relationship with no intimacy or true connection. We don't trust people who are crazy or doggedly stubborn because they're not rational. Nobody genuinely wants to be in a relationship with someone who fights that way. The only reason they stay is they think they have no other option. And that is no way to build a solid foundation for a relationship. Not only does winning fights by being crazy or stubborn destroy any hope of intimacy, it's no way to plan a future. And it numbs us to life. 4. Your kids are more important than you. Deal with it. If you're a parent, you already know this. If you're considering being a parent, you need to learn this. Your kids are more important than you are. The well-being of children simply comes first, whether you like it or not. Your kids are dependent on you, and there's nothing you can do about it. The courts know this, your community knows this, and you need to know this. The implication is that you're going to be making a lot of choices that are not comfortable to you personally, but are right for the family. We always hear about the lack of sleep and sex that come with having a newborn in the house. What we hear about less often are the other gut-wrenching choices that parents are sometimes faced with. The cinematic example is the parent who pushes a child out of the way of an onrushing vehicle, knowing full well that he'll be killed himself in the process. Less heroically, however, parents make daily sacrifices, foregoing an extraordinary career opportunity because of a critical scheduling issue with the kids, or giving up the car, or the party, or the trip. The list is endless. And when the time comes to make the sacrifice, bemoaning the choices doesn't change their inevitability. It just harms your relationship. A very challenging circumstance that arose a lot in the divorce context was the following. Parent A makes a unilateral choice about the kids that is somehow bad for parent B. Parent B is angry that they hadn't been consulted and wants to change the situation back, or at least to get an apology and a promise that it won't happen again. Neither of these is forthcoming because it can't be changed back at this point, and parent A thinks it was the right choice anyway, so isn't inclined to apologize. Obviously, this is not ideal. Parent A should have consulted parent B and should definitely apologize. It's not surprising that parent B is angry. In the divorce context, 
A series of these kinds of behaviors often add up, they never get resolved, and the resentment eventually kills the relationship. And that's when I would get a visit from one of the parents. So it's tough medicine, but this is the time to swallow the indignation. The kids are more important than your ego. Do what's right for the kids and everything else will fall into place. Or maybe it won't, but it doesn't much matter. What matters is your kids. And the ego, well, if we're being honest, we know it's a construct anyway. Five, the truth is coming out eventually. The truth will out. Now, by this, I do not mean a factual truth. I mean core truths about your identity. You might or might not get away with buying that handbag or whatever it is that you want to purchase. But if there's something about you yourself that you're trying to bury, it will come out eventually and probably not in ways that you'll like. The classic example in the media is the aggressively homophobic public figure who turns out to be having an affair with a gay prostitute. But this plays itself out in less extreme examples as well. The man who moved to the Midwest for the sake of his wife's career but feels emasculated and so lashes out about household chores. The woman who craves a certain sex act in the bedroom but scared to ask for it and so slowly wilts in the marriage, becoming ever more distant from her spouse. When a core truth goes unexpressed or some experience deeply triggers us in our relationship but we try to bury it, it will not stay buried for long. If we don't deal with the triggers head on, they worm their way to the surface as resentment or misplaced anger or sudden spitefulness. They will come out. If you're noticing a nagging thought, it's best to speak it. Certainly pick your time and place. Be gentle in how you articulate yourself. Take responsibility for your experience, but do speak it. If there's a fundamental truth that's not coming out, the cost is life satisfaction. Avoiding a core truth about yourself hurts far more over the long term than the short term pain of being honest. Next time, I'll cover some of the more practical skills that, well, unbelievably, most of us never learn or discuss before we start our adult lives and head into marriage. Well, that is it for the Divorce Lawyer's Guide to Marriage Part 2. Thanks for listening. I very much appreciate your doing so. Listen, as always, if you've got questions, comments, or ideas for the new format of the show, reach out. I'd love to hear from you. You can find our Facebook page at facebook.com slash togethershow. Twitter and Instagram are both at together underscore show, or you can email me at host at together.guide. We have changed the website to together.show, but I haven't updated my email yet, so you've still got to email me at host at together.guide. Well, folks, that's it for this week. Talk to you next week. Bye for now.